All right, go ahead and take out your textbooks if you would. Please open up to page 204. And last night for homework, you did numbers 24 through 27. Good and good. All right, and Kendall, good to have you back with us again. Question number 24, how is the net force on a body subjected to parallel forces determined? Michael? The net force on a body subjected to parallel forces is determined by measuring the pivot or rotation. Um, you're kind of leaning on toward torques. They were they were staying off of torques initially on 24. What did you have, Audrey? Um, the net force on a body is subjected to parallel forces is determined by indications of a negative or a positive sum. Okay, and then you find the sum. That, that's what it's at. That was the answer. You find the sum of all the forces, assuming forces in one direction are positive, forces in the other direction are negative. That's all it was. Now, number 25, when several torques operate on the same body, how may the direction of rotation be predicted? Michael? The direction of rotation can be determined by finding the direction of the greatest torque. Mm, not necessarily. For instance, let's suppose um, we've got a door on the hinges and Michael, you're pushing on one side and suppose uh, four siblings are on the other side. Guarantee you, even if Jane's one of the siblings, you are producing the greatest torque. But if the four of them are on the other side, I'm sorry, you're probably not winning, okay? Uh, for one on four, even if you individually have the greatest torque, the sum of all the torques on the other side is gonna overcome you. So, Audrey, I didn't have that either. I said by finding the separate torques and then the parallel torque. Well, you will, right? You'll find the sum of all of the torques by designating torques as either clockwise or counterclockwise, and whichever of those two sums is greater will determine the direction of rotation. Uh, number 26, for what are the two conditions that must be satisfied for a body to be in static equilibrium? Michael? The two conditions need to be satisfied for static equilibrium. <laughs> translational and rotational equilibrium. Good. If a body is both translational and rotational equilibrium, it is in static equilibrium. Or you may have said, if the sum of all the forces equals zero and the sum of all the torques equals zero. Either answer would be good. And number 27, in applying the conditions of equilibrium to a practical problem, how should you choose a pivot point? I actually mentioned this in the last lesson. Audrey? Uh, one can choose a pivot point by using the known force and picking it to be at one of the ends of the diagram, and its advantage is zero um, net force. Or zero net torque. Yeah, torque. Good. All right, good. The two ideas to choosing a pivot point, put it where there's a known force, or if there's two known forces, that's even better, and put it in an end is highly recommended. All right, let's go and review some things we talked about in our last lesson. Um, talking a lot about torque. And uh, said so torque is defined as what, Kendall? Um, force times radius. So as we think of these different torques, force times radius. For torque that is measured in two different types of units. It can be measured in class Newton meters, Newton meters or it could be measured in pound feet. Either of those units are used. Normally it'll be Newton meters, but we're going to work a problem here in a second since we're in the United States of America, amen? And we'll do a problem in pound feet just because... We're Americans, and that's what we do. All right, so anyway, pound feet coming up uh, in just a moment. But again, it's not so much just how much force is applied, but where is the force applied? The further from the pivot point the force is applied, the greater effect on rotation or the greater torque that that force will put out. Um, we said there's two directions of torque. What are those two directions, Audrey? Um, clockwise and clockwise and counterclockwise, and uh, what is produced if all the clockwise torques and all the counterclockwise torques cancel each other out? Uh, equilibrium. What kind of equilibrium? Um, rotational. rotational equilibrium. And so we are assuming static equilibrium in our problems. We are assuming that all the forces will cancel and all the torques will cancel as well to produce this rotational and therefore static equilibrium. Um, Let's go and take a look at a problem that's similar to one that was in the book. You remember the last problem we worked in the textbook? There was a barbell, and we called it the dumbbell, but it's a barbell. And uh, why do I always look at him when I... <laughs> anyway, it was a barbell, and uh, they had unequal masses on either ends, and for some reason they wanted to string this thing up from a cord so that instead of like that, with the heavier weight down, it would actually balance. And we found exactly where it had to be, had to be balanced. Let's do a similar problem, but slightly more realistic. For one thing, I'm going to call it a barbell. 
All right, so let's suppose, uh, jot these numbers down, we have a five foot long barbell. And we need to understand a barbell has weight, right? If you've ever, anyone ever lifted weights, bent anything? Okay, you know the bar has weight. In fact, if you do like a burnout or something, the last thing you do in the burnout is you finish by just lifting the bar, right? So your weights diminish, diminish, diminish until the end, and then the next three days you can't move your arms. Uh, but anyway, the barbell has weight. Let's suppose it is a 40 pound barbell. Let's make this 5.0 feet, so we have the two sig figs. 5.0 foot barbell, which is about the length of a standard barbell, about 40 to 45 pounds is how much they usually weigh. Let's assume that the mass is equally distributed. All right, so there's not a part where it's somehow lighter, for instance. It's a solid bar of solid consistency. It's not like aluminum here and iron here. Okay, nobody makes them like that. So it's a safe bet to assume that the mass is concentrated equally. Let's suppose at one end we have 50 point pounds, and at the other end we have 35 pounds. Now this is where it's unrealistic because nobody would lift weights like this. But we're going to say we do it anyway, okay? Where would you have to pick it up in order for it to balance perfectly? That's the question. Well, as we work this problem together, the first thing we want to do is draw our free body diagram. But we will not draw the object as a dot or a box. Because it's a torque problem, we need to draw the object as a, a line, right? We're going to represent the length of the object because we have varying distances. We're going to represent all of the forces as arrows still, though. And forces will either go up or they will go down. Now, they're going to become torques, which will either be clockwise or counterclockwise, but initially we'll draw them as arrows. So on one end of the bar, pulling down, we have 50 pounds. On the other end, pulling down, we have 35 pounds. But there's one more weight in the problem. In class, that is the weight of the... The bar itself, right? The bar itself, and we're going to put it directly in this middle, right? We talked about center of gravity, center of mass. The bar's center of mass, if it's uniformly distributed mass throughout, which it should be, the 40 pounds is essentially concentrated at the middle. But there is one more force that's described when I said we're going to pick it up. There is a force upward, and that's the applied force. Where are we going to pick it up probably? Are we going to pick it up right in the middle? Not if there's 50 pounds on one end, right? We're going to have to pick it up closer to the 50-pound the 50 50 end, whichever end is heavier. Now, it's not going to be at the end, obviously. And it may not even be way down here, but somewhere over here, somewhere shifted to the 40, toward the 50-pound side, is where we're going to have to pick it up in order for it to balance. We're trying to figure out exactly where. But we at least know it's somewhere over there. Does that make sense? All right, how much force is it going to take to lift this bar? A hundred twenty-five pounds, right? The sum of all these forces has to be countered by yet another force. And so here we have translational equilibrium. All the forces cancel. But we need to not just make the forces cancel, we need to make the torques cancel. And to equate this to torque, it's not enough to simply consider the force class, but also the radius. radius. How do you know what the radius is? It all depends on where you put your pivot point. There are four places we can put the pivot. And we're going to work this problem four times, once for every pivot. The goal is that by the time we're done with this, you have a very good understanding of how to work these problems. So it's not just to beat a dead horse or to fill time. It's telling by the time you've seen it four ways, there's going to be no question in your mind how to approach these problems. My recommendation was, if you can, put the pivot point at one end. Let's just start on the left end. Assuming that's the pivot, what is the radius of the 50-pound force? Zero. And one of the benefits, I said, of putting the pivot point at a known force is that that particular force's radius will be zero, which is wonderful, meaning what's the torque? Zero. In other words, I don't even need to worry about that one. The other big benefit of putting the pivot at one end is that anything that pushes down has got to work together. In this case, anything going down class is producing what direction of torque? producing clockwise torque. So these are both going to be clockwise torques. This then, the opposing force, will also be an opposing torque. Again, that's not true if the pivot's somewhere in the middle. 
But if the pivot is at one end, all the downs will technically work together and the ups will all work together. So this will be a counterclockwise torque. What is the distance from the pivot to the point where I pick it up? I don't know. That's the whole point is to figure out that value. So we're going to represent this radius as x because I know it. I do, however, know this radius. Remember, I told you the bar is how long? Five foot. It's a five foot long barbell, right? So if the mass is concentrated at the center, the center of mass, also center of gravity, um, what is the radius of this 40 pound force? 2.5 uh, feet. What's the radius of the 35 pound force? Five feet, because it's the full distance away. That's the other benefit of having the pivot point at one end is it makes it very easy numbers for us. We like easy numbers. So we have 40 pounds of force with a radius of two and a half feet. What's the torque of the bar? 100 pound feet. We have 35 pounds at the other end with a radius of five feet. What is the torque of the 35 pound force? 175 pound feet. Both of these are clockwise, and we know that the sum of the clockwise torques must equal the sum of the counterclockwise torques. These are the two clockwise. What is the sum of all the clockwise torques? 275 pound feet. Now, the only counterclockwise torque is the 125 pounds with a radius of x. What is that torque? How many pound feet of torque is that? 125x, right? Still force times radius. Now, technically, the, uh, the feet aren't included here, but the 125 pounds is. That basically means that the pounds will cancel, and x will be left in terms of feet. So to solve, all we have to do is divide by 125. Easy math. Well, for a calculator, at least. And uh, what is the radius of the person lifting the bar? 2.2. 2.2. Feet. There we go. Questions on this problem worked the first way. But what if Kendall's like, no, 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 Mr. Nadasky, no. I am no leftist. I do not want the pivot point at the left end. I'm right winger all the way. I don't know if she is. I'm just making this up. So but suppose Kendall says, no, I want the pivot point to be at this end of the ball. I'll still take your advice and put it at one end. But I'm not going to put it on the left. I just I can't do that with my principles. Well, so be it. It would be the same forces anyway, wouldn't it? 50 pounds on one end, 35 pounds on the other, 40 pounds in the middle, 125 pounds just shifted a little over from the center of the bar. Right? All right. If Kendall puts the pivot point at the right end, what is the radius of the 35 pounds? Now that's the zero, which means zero torque. I don't even have to worry about that number. The 50 pounds now has a radius of five feet. So the torque that the 50 pounds produces is 250 pound feet. The 40 pounds still has a radius of 2.5 feet. And so therefore, the torque of the uh, 40 pounds is still 100 pound feet. But what changed by putting the pivot at the right end is that both of these forces produce which direction of torque? Counterclockwise now. So now these are both counterclockwise. But notice they still work together, don't they? And then the 125 pounds, I don't know its distance from Kendall's end. So we'll call that distance, or that radius, x, because I don't know it. So therefore, the torque that's produced is still going to be 125x, force times radius. And this is now going which direction? Clockwise about this pivot point. 
So notice the equation isn't going to be that different. It's just that now the clockwise torque is the 125x, and the counterclockwise torque, and that has changed in number just a little bit. Um, oh, this was 250. You said 250, I wrote 200. Yeah, 350 pound-feet. We divide by the 125. What do we get for the x or the radius of the 125 pound force? Two point eight feet. So we said it's two point eight feet from the thirty-five pound end. Well, that's not the number we had last time. What did we have last time? Oh, but think about it. Wouldn't that also be two point two feet from the fifty pound end if it's a five foot long bar? It's the same answer, right? It's written two different ways, which makes it fun for me as a teacher on my answer key. Because there's a lot of ways you could describe your answer, right? So uh, I've got to be ready for all kinds of different answers. But this is the exact same answer. It's the same location. Let's suppose that Michael's like, I'm a bit of a moderate here. I don't, I don't like to be extreme at one end of the, of the spectrum or the other. I like to keep things in the middle. And let's be honest, really, truly. A bar should pivot at the middle, should it not? Yea, verily. So Michael says, no, nah, I'm putting the pivot right smack dab in the middle. Notice the forces are still all going to be the same. We still have 50 pounds at one end, 40 pounds smack dab in the middle of the pivot, 35 pounds on the next end, and we're still going to lift it somewhere over here with a force of 125 pounds. None of the forces have changed. So the way in which you set up the diagram is not going to be able to vary depending on how you choose to solve it. The location of the pivot point is the one thing that can vary, and as a result, the radii. Because what is the radius now of my 40 pound force? Zero. There is no radius for the 40 pound force, so therefore the torque of the 40 pounds is zero. Oh, Sherry, put out some more chalk for me. Nice work. All right, so the radius is zero, therefore torque is zero. Remember, it's a five foot long bar. What's the radius of the 35 pounds? It's two and a half feet. What's the radius of the 50 pounds? Also two and a half feet, going in the direction, of course. And what's the radius of the 125 pounds? Well, I don't know, so we call it x. At least one thing's staying consistent, right? That radius now becomes x. Well, notice something. If this is the pivot, do you see that these two are working in opposite directions now? And that's why I don't like putting the pivot in the middle. Sorry, Michael. Um, is because this is pushing it class clockwise, while this one is going counterclockwise. This one, remember, here's the pivot. This one's going clockwise. He said counter to me. Clockwise. These two are working together now. This one is flying solo. So when I set up my equation, remember I'm going to take the sum of all the clockwise torques and make that equal to the sum of all the counterclockwise torques. Well, now there's two clockwise torques. There's the torque being produced by the lifting per party, which we still have to represent class as 125x. But there's also the clockwise torque of 35 pounds at a two and a half foot radius. How much torque is that? 87 and a half pound feet. There's only one counterclockwise torque, and that is 125 pound-feet. We're going to subtract away the 87.5 to get, uh, what is that, uh, 37.5? And then divide both sides by 125 to get x is equal to exactly 0.3 feet. Now notice. That's a very different answer than we got last time, isn't it? Or is it? Remember, if half the distance is 2.5, and we said it was 2.8, it would make sense it'd be 0.3 feet. Or 2.2 feet to here, an additional 0.3 would get you to the pivot for the 2.5. So it's a third way of saying the exact same answer. But did you notice, made a little bit more complicated by having the pivot in the central location. A little bit annoying. I save the best for last. Because you have people like Audrey, who's very much, she's not a right, right winger, she's not a left winger, she's not even really a moderate. She stays out of politics. Audrey tries to stay neutral. 
But Audrey is very literal. Things have a certain way of being there. They may not deviate. Technically, when you pick up that bar, where will it pivot? Wherever you pick it up. So Audrey says, no, this should be the pivot point. All right, so let's work it this way now. For Audrey's benefit, <laughs> I'm putting words in everybody's mouth. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> though I, I do feel like if anyone were to insist on the uh, pickup point being the pivot, it would probably be Audrey. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm judging Audrey wrong here. All right, so we've got the, uh, in the middle of the bar, of course, we have the weight of the bar. We have the 35 pounds at one end, we have the 50 pounds at the other end, and then right here we have the 125 pounds, and that, my friends, is the pivot. Now, if that's the pivot, then the radius of that particular force class becomes zero, and therefore there's no torque by picking up the bar. The torque is going to come from the other three forces. <clears throat> whale, 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 whale. I don't know what this distance is, or I mean, technically we do because we've already solved the problem, but pretending we hadn't worked it yet, I don't know this distance, nor that one, nor that one. But only one of them is allowed to be x. <laughs> so, Audrey, since this was your idea, supposedly, which one do you want to be the x? to the 35, the big one's going to be the x. All right, now here's what we know. If this distance is x, and here the whole bar is 5, and x of that 5 is right here, how would I describe this distance? x minus, no, 5 minus x. 5 minus x, the whole length, minus whatever this distance is, is that distance, right? Anytime you know a total, going back to algebra class, if you know a total, call one unknown x, the other total minus x. The total length is 5, part of it's x, part of it's 5 minus x. So this radius is 5 minus x, and this radius is x. What about the 40 pounds? Well, remember, this distance is 2.5. This distance, the greater distance, is x. The difference will be the larger minus the smaller. So if this is two and a half feet from the center of the bar to the end, the distance from the center of the bar here would be class x minus 2.5. This is where it's particularly annoying if you truly call the pivot the pivot. You end up with x's everywhere, and it gets really messy. But we can still solve it because we're not lazy. So we'll say, if this is the pivot, this is a minus sign, by the way. Okay? If this is the pivot, this force produces what direction of torque? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. This produces which direction of torque? Clockwise. Clockwise. This produces which direction of torque? Clockwise. Clockwise also. So these two are working together. So we'll say that 35x, whatever that is, plus the 40 times the quantity x negative 2.5 is equal to that single counterclockwise torque, 50 times the quantity 5 negative x. Now, don't stone Audrey. Remember, this was only theoretically her idea, okay? Don't be mad at Audrey here. Um, no, don't be mad at me. Just be thankful that you're learning. And you're learning what not to do. Don't do it this way, because it's hard. We're lazy. All right, let's distribute the 40 class. And distribute the 50. Let's combine our x's over here. And since this is the little one, let's also bring the 50x over as a positive 50. 125x, and at the same time, let's move the 100 over as a positive 100. And when we divide both sides by 125, we'll get x is equal to? Now remember, x was the distance Audrey chose to save from the 35 pound. We already saw that number. This is 2.8 feet. Or x minus 2.5 would be 0.3 feet. 
or 5 minus 2 would be 2.2 feet. So how would you write your answer? There's four, uh, three ways you could write the answer. You could say 2.2 feet from the 50 pound end. You could say 0.3 feet from the middle toward the 50 pound end, or you could say 2.8 feet from the 35 pound end. Which is the easiest way to think of it? This one. So the best way is 2.2 feet from the 50 pound end, but all of them would be correct. Do we see how to set it up and how technically you can pick any point to be the pivot? It's just easier if you pick an end, all right? Do we feel like we understand the setup on these problems? Draw the forces, all of them, pick a pivot point, figure out all the radii, make your counterclockwise forces, torques, excuse me, equal to the clockwise torques, and you solve. Let's take a look at an example problem now in your books, page 202, page 202, and look at example 13.13. .13. And uh, read us that example for us, if you would, Audrey. A man and a boy carry a load of 485 newtons by suspending it from a uniform pole carried on their shoulders. The pole is 3.4 meters long and weighs 82 newtons. If the man is to carry twice as much of the load as the boy, where should the load be suspended? All right. So they drew the free body diagram, or not really free body, but whatever, the, the picture for us. We're going to draw it on our papers as well. So let's start by drawing our line. That's the pole. At one end of the pole, there is a man. At the other end of the pole is the, the boy, right? So we have boy and we have man. All right? Man, boy. Now, that's what's lifting the pole up, right? But the reason they're lifting the pole up is because there is a weight pulling down that's countering them. Now, they're not going to lift more than they have to. They're going to lift exactly enough to lift the pole and hold it there. So there's going to be a balance of forces here. Their forces are going to balance the two downward forces. What are the two things that bear down on the pole, class? The load. The load, which we don't know where the load is, do we? But it does tell us the man is supposed to carry more weight than the boy. Where should I put the load so that the man ends up carrying more of the weight? Closer to the man. So the load is somewhere here. Somewhere closer to the man is where the load is going to be. Um, and then also, there's one more thing bearing down besides the load. The pole itself has weight, right? Even if there were nothing on the pole, it would still take some amount of force to lift the pole. And we're going to assume that the pole is of uniform mass, so right in the middle, is where we'll have the pole. So far, so good? There's the four forces. Now, it tells us that the pole's force, or the pole's weight class, is 82 newtons. And the load on the pole is 485 newtons. How much force, then, is bearing down? Five hundred sixty-seven newtons. How much force then must the man and the boy combine to lift up? The total force up must equal five sixty-seven newtons. Now that doesn't mean the boy has to apply five sixty-seven, nor the man, but together they've got to equal five sixty-seven. How much of it is the boy? I don't know. How much of it is the man? I don't know, but I know the man's twice as much. So for a moment here, I could represent the boy's force as. X and the man's force as 2x. But if combined they must equal 567, I can use an equation to solve for their forces even before I consider pivot points. What's the equation I need for the force? Yeah, the combined forces, x and 2x equal 567, divided by 3, what is x? 189. So that means instead of boy's force being x, we can now call the boy's force. 189 newtons upward. And the man's force is double that. 378 newtons. So even though it comes at the forces with this idea of they're unknown, they give me enough information to know every single force. That's nice. That means it's going to be a lot like the last problem we did, where we knew all the forces. The question was where. A question with a radius. Now, 
I could put the pivot one of four different places. And you're like, don't call it Audrey, don't call it Audrey. I have faith in Audrey. All right, Audrey, which of the pivot points, I'm just gonna say one, two, three, and four, which pivot point should we use for this problem? I could use the boy, he is at least at one end. But because it's gonna be closer to the man, we're pretty, we're confident it's gonna be closer to the man, let's make the man's end the pivot. That just gives me a smaller answer in the end, right? As opposed to a longer number, bigger number, we'll have the smaller number. So I would recommend this as the pivot point. It would still work, as I showed in the last problem. It would work if she picked the boy's pivot. It's just getting smaller numbers if I pick the man. Make sense? Also, if I pick the man, his radius class becomes zero. And so the bigger number has no torque. The boy does have a radius, and therefore he does have torque. What is the boy's radius going to be? Well, if you're calling the man's end of the pivot, whatever the length of the pole is, and it tells us it's a 3.4 meter long pole. So apparently, 3.4 meters is his radius. The pole itself, we said, its own weight, if it's uniform mass, would be exactly in the middle. So what is going to be the radius of the pole? 1.7 meters. What about the radius of the load? Well, that's what we're finding, so let's call that x. Do we see how to get all the forces and all the radii? Now, the nice thing about the pivot being at the end is you know if they're up, they all work together. If they're down, they all work together. Technically, because this is clockwise, this one is standing alone. Because both of these are counterclockwise, they work together against the clockwise. But we don't even have to think that through if we put the pivot at one end, just think ups and downs are contrary, right? So we could say that the uh, 189 times 3.4, whatever that is, I'll get it in a minute, is going to equal the 82 times the 1.7 plus the 485x. Let's do some quick math on the calculator. What is 189 times 3.4? Say that again? 642.6. 642.6 newton meters. 82 times 1.7? 139.4 newton meters plus the 485x. I'm trusting that Michael's giving the correct answer since the girls are not saying, no, it's this. So uh, you got the same thing, girls? Ladies, excuse me. All right. Subtract the 139.4, divide by the 485. Okay, I'll do it myself, too. Uh, <laughs> and divide. And yeah. What do we get? What are the x? One point zero three seven blah blah blah. How many sig figs in this problem? Trace. So we'll say one point zero four meters. Now I can't just say when it says where should the load be placed. I can't say one point zero four meters. What that doesn't mean anything. I would have to give a frame of reference, 1.04 meters from the man's end. Now, what would Audrey's answer have been? Well, she'd have been 3.4 minus that, right? So if Audrey had done it her way, she would have gotten 2.36 meters from the boy's end. And I would accept that answer. We might have also gotten, we might have also gotten, if you picked the pole as the pivot, you would have gotten 0.662 meters from the middle of the pole toward the man. That's a much awkward or more awkward way of saying it, which again is a benefit of picking an end point as the pivot. It's an easier frame of reference. All right, but any of those answers would have worked. Questions on this example? Yes, sir? The answer they had is completely different from ours. Their answer is wrong. They say, point, uh, they say point zero 0.0835, that should be 0.662, and the reason is, look at, right at the very bottom where they have their answer, look right above it at the uh, division problem, look at their denominator, 385 newtons in the denominator, it's 485 newtons. Mm -hmm. So they divided by the wrong thing and got the wrong answer. It, it's corrected in my book now, but yeah, I, I should have mentioned that, so thank you for, for looking at that. Yes, if you're following along with your textbook, your book is wrong, sorry. They're human too. I've made a couple of mistakes on video this year. They make a mistake every now and then too. I think I've made a mistake. Have I made a mistake this year in physics? I'm sure I have. You did counterclockwise. I did counterclockwise instead of clockwise the other day. Yes, thank you. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, I, I definitely definitely made my share of mistakes. I'll forgive them for theirs. All right. I say, have I been perfect? That means it's coming. <laughs> All right. Questions on this. All right. I wanted to work 13.14 with you as well, but we do not have time because you've got to get to P today. Um, let's see here. That may mean I need to modify your homework just a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. So <clears throat> that's a real shame because I really needed to get to product <laughs> example 14. Um, well, you lose some, you lose some. Um, page 205, problem 20. Now, draw the diagram and you're going to have to think it through. Really going to have to think that one through because there's some, some cool details going on there that make the problem interesting and somewhat realistic, but it's, it's taken some thought. Here's the plan, by the way, for coming up in the next few lessons. Tomorrow, we should finish up all of this material. Okay, so tomorrow, lesson 101, we'll finish everything. On Monday, lesson 102, we'll be reviewing for the test. Tuesday's your test. That'll be lesson 103 is your test over chapter 13. All right. Well, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of your day.